Why hello you lovely little peppercorns, my name's Noah Lee, god of game criticism and lord of excellent taste, and welcome to the Summer Catch-Up, a series of more laid-back videos about games from earlier this year that I didn't have a chance to talk about. And today, we're going to be taking a look at one of the year's most interesting titles, as well as the games that inspired it, as it manages to do something that I don't think I've ever seen done before, or at least not as successfully as this, but something that I think our glorious medium could do with a heck of a lot more of. You're probably already familiar with the story of Nintendo's attempts in the early 1990s to create and market a CD-based add-on for the Super Nintendo as disc-based consoles looked, at the time, to be the next big thing, as did full-motion video games that would finally allow us to play games that looked as realistic as movies. Finally, you can watch a movie while also pressing buttons. The future is officially here. Yeah, it's easy for us who are 30-odd years removed from this era to point and laugh at the absurdity of the entire game industry from roughly 1990 to 1995, going all in on both this type of game as well as the CDs and multimedia devices created to bring them to life, but the truth is that this half decade was a necessary threshold that needed to be crossed before video games could mature into something greater than they already were. Essentially, we needed to get it out of our thick skulls that video games should try to emulate movies, as from their earliest inception as a retail force, this had been a quick and easy marketing gimmick to attract those with a penchant for new and emerging technologies and a disposable income, which is why the second, third, and fourth console generations together formed the heyday of the movie licensed game. I mean, after all, why would you watch E.T. when you can play it. Okay, bad example, but this was very much a common selling point for a lot of these movie licensed games back then, so when the technology finally caught up with the desires of game publishers to milk this marketing gimmick to the point that you now actually could have an interactive film a la early Laserdisc arcade games like Dragon's Lair and Space Ace, but from the comfort of your own home, it's easy to see why there was such a strong push for disc-based consoles despite the technology still being in its infancy. Combine this with the fact that, for a time, the Sega CD, which released in Japan in 1991, appeared to be poised to dominate the console market, as well as the high praise from both test audiences and the mainstream media to not only FMV games, but also more traditional games that were utilizing the technology to make bigger and more detailed worlds with more robust audio, such as Lunar the Silver Star and Sonic CD, and the message was clear. If you weren't going all in on CD-based games, you were going to be left behind. At least that's how it must have looked to Nintendo, who during this time was in secret collaboration with Sony to develop the aforementioned SNES CD add-on before screwing them over and embarrassing embarrassing them in front of the entire Japanese business world by deciding to license the multimedia technology that Philips was working on instead. I won't go into much more detail here because it really isn't important to the topic of this video and the fact that we can really only speculate on what happened between Philips and Nintendo that led to the infamous games I'm about to talk about, but needless to say, the Super Nintendo CD never actually made it to market, while these early disc-based consoles quickly lost their appeal and cost everyone who jumped into that fire millions of dollars and lost revenue. However, Philips, who had just brought their technically impressive but actually mediocre CDI multimedia console to market, didn't appear to get the memo, and hired the soon-to-be defunct developer Animation Magic to develop a couple of infamous Zelda games that were rushed to market just in time for the 1993 holiday season. Released on the same day as a duology that could be played in either order, strangely mirroring how Nintendo and Capcom would later release Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages, Link the Faces of Evil and Zelda The Wand of Gamelon were critically panned for their punishing and inscrutable gameplay, but also lauded for their charming, if a bit strange, animated cutscenes and overall world. However, due to their history and infamy, these two games, along with a third Zelda CDI title that often gets lumped in with them but actually has no relation to them whatsoever, so we won't be talking about it, have never really left the public consciousness, baffling players on the early internet for over a decade before finally going mainstream due to the rise of YouTube poops and retro game reviews in the mid-2000s. And thanks to this meme status, the two games have managed to stay relevant as an easy punching bag for account countless wannabe critics, game reviewers, and shit posters for roughly 20 years now. I'm proud to say that I'm not one of these people, because while I've always enjoyed the memes that have come from these games, the truth is that I've always had a soft spot for the Faces of Evil and the Wand of Gamelon as games, from the moment I first heard of them on the Zelda Universe forums when I was in middle school, to the moment when I finally got to play them for myself after getting a CDI of my own. Now, I've never thought they were good games, but I've always found them to be a lot better than people give them credit for, and 
have been fascinated not only by their history, but by how interesting and innovative their gameplay actually is, for the time at least. This sort of proto-Metroidvania progression system that sees you playing through these bite-sized levels multiple times as you return with new items and abilities that allows you to further your exploration of each area, combined with the sense that just around every quarter you'll be rewarded with another wacky character interaction that will not only make you laugh, but probably unnerve you a bit as well, made for a couple of games whose only real flaw is the punishing nature of the controls and hit detection which makes it difficult for most players to actually play them long enough to understand what they're all about and experience the strangeness of its characters and world. These cutscenes are of course the star of the show, which is why they've captured the attention of so many internet denizens over the years, though usually in the form of holding them up as proof of how terrible these games are and for their perceived butchering of the Zelda mythos at the hands of Phillips. And that's just not fair, because every scrap of animation found in Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon is just a treat, and let's be real here, at this point Nintendo didn't even really have much of an established Zelda mythos for Phillips to destroy, as they were only four Zelda games in, and each of them was quite a bit different from all the others, while the tone and humor of both the marketing for the franchise as well as the beloved Friday afternoon cartoon that aired as part of the Super Mario Bros. Super Show are far closer to that of these two CDI titles than modern fans are willing to admit. These licensing restrictions were, in hindsight, probably a saving grace for these games from an artistic standpoint as it forced the developers to craft their own world, tone, and themes, creating what is essentially a work of fan fiction that merely borrows elements from the source material in order to craft something completely new. I've always thought there was something here, something special that could have been great if only Phillips hadn't rushed the games to market, because that's always been my take on these games, that they're bad not because this wasn't a concept worth exploring or because Animation Magic was an incompetent developer, though that is up for debate, but because these these games are unfinished and needed at least another three or four more months in the oven by my estimate. And as it turns out, I wasn't the only one, as Seth Fulkerson, an indie game developer who also goes by the handle Doppley, thought so too, to the point that he went to the trouble of spending four years to port and remaster both games in Game Maker Studios so they could be played on modern hardware without emulation, while also cleaning them up a bit to make them more palatable to modern audiences. Now normally I don't like it when retro games are overhauled to feel more modern, as most of the time I think this takes away a key aspect of what makes the games interesting in the first place, but in this case, I think it has completely salvaged the games without overdoing it, and I'm fairly certain that had Animation Magic been given the breathing room necessary to finish the games, they would have ended up quite similar to these modern ports, though probably still with some of the baggage common to most games of the time, such as Limited Lives and Continues. Essentially, he finished the games, to the point that they're now not only very playable, but also quite enjoyable as well, rather than trying to alter the past as so many other fan recreations and ROM hacks of classic and beloved games tend to do, he instead saw an opportunity to take a couple of games that are universally reviled and tweak them just enough that the aspects that were always present and quite interesting now begin to shine through. This is a type of artistry that's so incredibly difficult to achieve, as altering someone else's work with the intent of salvaging it necessarily comes with the peril of subconsciously injecting your own ideas, thoughts, and biases into the work that can alter it on a fundamental level without you even being aware that that's what you're doing. There's a big difference between changing the movement speed, character weight, and adding quality of life changes because you want the game to feel more modern, as is so often the case, and is so rarely done with the light touch and humility necessary not to completely alter the core of the game, and doing the same because you feel those changes would better fit with the original vision and complement the aspects you're leaving untouched. In the original games, for example, the controls were more than a little convoluted, stiff, and sluggish, while enemies pivot and prance a peppier pace around you thanks to the draconian requirements by Phillips that every game released on the platform be playable with this thing. Ugh. But in Doppley's remasters, Link and Zelda's movement speed and character weight is much more in line with not only the enemies that surround you, but also with the standard platforming feel of the day. Cleaned up like this, the remasters really highlight just how interesting and, dare I say, artful the original games were. Had they been initially released in a similar state on the ephemeral Super Nintendo CD, I guarantee you that they'd now be beloved classics with a myriad of genuine fans, not merely meme fodder and punching bags to be mined by YouTube hacks for easy views. I mean, they still have some pretty glaring foundational issues like asinine enemy placement, poor conveyance and hit detection, and hazards, platforms, and doors that are often difficult to discern from the hand-painted backdrops, so Doppley's minor changes aren't going to be enough to convince the majority of players that these games are now worth a damn, but the changes he did make are enough to highlight how close Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon have always been to being decent little games and interesting works of art. All it took was for someone with the willingness and passion to understand them, and the humility to preserve them rather than trying to make them his own, to bring
bring them up to this level. And that, to me, is the most impressive part of Doppley's remasters, that they don't try to fix the foundational issues and instead accept that they're a core part of what makes these games so unique. He understood, as an artist, that it wasn't his place to make sweeping changes, nor did he even think it necessary as he already loved the games as they were. He made his remasters not out of a desire to prove he could do it better, but to prove that they've always been a worthwhile experience that just needed a touch-up. However, after doing this touch-up and understanding Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon on a far deeper level than perhaps anyone else, he realized that there was still more that needed to be explored with this concept, this presentation style, this tone, and humorous locution. A task that can only be broached by starting from scratch and shedding the baggage of these games' unfortunate reputation. And after another four years of work, Arzette, the Jewel of Faramore, was finally born. Developed by a coalition of artists led by Fulkerson under the cleverly homophonic name CDI Software and published by Limited Run Games, Arzette quickly gained traction upon its announcement with many excited to play the game, though many more seemingly confused as to why you'd make a game that pays homage to those games in particular, while many others were quick to assume this was merely another tongue-in-cheek parody meant to poke fun at a pair of notoriously hated games. And I'll admit, when I first watched the trailer for Arzette, I found myself a bit torn. On the one hand, I was excited that someone had revitalized a concept that I had always thought was worth returning to, but on the other hand, I was concerned that the game would be yet another takedown of a couple of games that have never really been given a fair shake by the vast majority of gamers. That is, until I played it and realized that my fears were completely unfounded, because Arzette the Jewel of Faramore is not only a loving homage to Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon, but a spiritual successor that pays them tribute without being beholden to them either. A true work of art, if ever there was one. Like its predecessors, RZ is built on a foundation of colorful pixel art atop a series of beautifully hand-painted backdrops and a catchy 16-bit CD-esque soundtrack. The levels are short and sweet and wholly isolated stages that can be returned to at any point via the game's map to further explore when you've gained new abilities or collected an item for a specific character. Enemies are simple and don't have much in the way of maneuvers, but are numerous enough and placed with such a careful hand that they can still keep you on your toes, and the controls are rock solid, allowing you to maneuver with ease while the abilities are Zet gains throughout her journey complement both the tone and style of the game, as well as the level design to such a strong degree that it would be impossible to alter one aspect without also changing the other. And of course, there are the cutscenes and character moments, which are... Hey, look everyone! It's the princess! I'm pretty sure they can see me. Yeah, but you always gotta be mindful of what's around ya. If you see anything nasty coming your way, you gotta... Knock it away with your weapon! <laughs> Glorious. The characters' dialogue and animation are absolutely the star of the show here, just as they were in Faces and Wand, but unlike those games, Arzette's core gameplay is strong enough that it can stand on its own, with a solid and enjoyable gameplay loop and level variety to the point that these non-gameplay elements act merely as cherry on top. For players who are unfamiliar with the originals, Arzette comes across as a fun little game with tons of heart that's more than likely going to get several playthroughs out of you, while those who have played Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon will find not only a perfected version of what those games were trying to be, but also one that's filled to the brim with a whole host of lovingly made and perfectly subtle winks and nods to the originals without ever distracting from the experience at hand. Arzette is at once a parody and a lovingly made spiritual successor that plays it completely straight with neither vitriol nor blind devotion towards its predecessors, a game that manages to stick the landing with its style and tone, but also further expand upon what can be done with this concept. I do, however, have to dock Arzette a few points for its inclusion of non animated dialogue presented in many of its side quests. Far from being a necessary evil due to the nature of adding more interactivity to flesh out the game and give you more impetus for exploration, these moments, however few they may be, stick out like a sword to Dongo after a rough night of bombing and to the point that they come across as little more than placeholders for animation that was never actually completed, while the side quests they're a part of that only rewards you with unnecessary upgrades which allow you to carry a greater number of each of your consumables feel wholly tacked on as well. That, however, is ultimately my only only real criticism, so the fact that it's such a minor one makes it pretty easy to overlook. And beyond that, I don't really have much more to say about Arzette that I haven't already touched on when talking about the Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon, as, taken as a whole, the game is just fantastic, one of the most artistically sound and wholly enjoyable games I've played all year, but I think the reason I enjoy it so much is because it does something that I've been wanting to see for a very long time. It revitalizes and sees value in the failed games of the past, and the potential to make great works of art on the foundations they've left behind. Something that's always bothered me about the culture of remake 
remakes and remasters, ports and updated versions of games is that we only ever seem to do this with games that were already a success, either commercially or one that gained an audience slowly as the years went on, the very kinds of games that don't need a remake or a remaster as they're already exceptional as they are. Obviously this is done primarily for marketing reasons, as publishers know that if a game is popular, it's likely its remake will be popular as well. After all, it's a lot easier to sell you something you already know you like rather than trying to convince you that something new is worth playing. Add on the reality that many aging gamers are hungry for the kind of nostalgia bait that reminds them of their younger days, and it's easy to see why this practice is so common. But why not do what Seth Fulkerson and company has done? Instead of remastering and remaking games that already work or making spiritual successors of beloved classics, why not mine the past for games that could work if only they were given the proper treatment, re-releasing and tidying them up on modern hardware or just using them as a jumping off point to make something new? And that's what's so special about our Zet and the work that Fulkerson and crew have done in revitalizing a concept that few even considered worthwhile and before that salvaging a couple of games that nearly everyone had written off as colossal failures worthy only of being laughed at, and in doing so they've become, intentionally or not, the pioneers of what I hope will be a more common practice as the years go on. As the technology of games has grown over the years, there's increasingly been a tendency to ignore the work that came before, both from players and developers, and while I'm all for innovation and continuing to push the boundaries of our medium in this forward-facing direction, I also think that we as developers, gamers, and critics need to reckon with the fact that innovation and artistry doesn't always come from blindly carving out a path ahead, because sometimes simply turning around and giving something a second or third attempt can launch us leaps and bounds further if only we're willing to keep an open mind, stay humble when tinkering with the failures of others and get to work building atop the myriad foundations left in ruin behind us. What Seth Fulkerson and his team have done with Arzet, as well as his work on the remasters of Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon, is this exact type of artistry, and maybe in this case it ends up being a dead end, as they've yet to prove that there's more that can be explored with this type of game, as the goal of Arzet was first to show that this concept was worthwhile and could work if given the proper attention and care, and in that regard, it's a resounding success, and hopefully a necessary stepping stone stone to something far greater. And that's what I'm hoping to see from the RZ sequel that's supposedly already in development, a deeper exploration and expansion on this concept and its core mechanics, as well as a willingness to experiment upon this now rock-solid foundation. And after spending more time than I care to admit submerged in their work, I firmly believe that Fulkerson and co. have exactly what it takes to do just that. From where I sit, the future looks very bright for them as artists working in this medium, and I can't wait to see what they bring us next. I'm Noah Lee, God of Game Criticism, and thus have I spoken.